So hello and welcome everyone to the next in our climate change event series. We have a panel of alumni from the business world discussing profit and protecting the planet. Um, we're pleased to welcome alumni and friends and we have alumni joining with matriculation years from 1953 through to current students from 2021. So I'm going to introduce our four panellists briefly. Um, so we have Andrew Herring, who had chemical engineering with us from 1983, who is CEO of Energy and Power Practice for Marsh UK and Ireland. We have Ken Rivers, who read engineering from 1971, who chairs the UK's Major Accident Hazards Strategic Forum and is a past president of the UK Petroleum Industry Association. Uh, also from 1971, we have David Tyler, who read Economics and chairs Domestic and General Limited and The White Company, and was founding chair involved with the setup of Chapter Zero 2019. And our discussion today will be chaired by Gillian Karen Cumberledge, who read History at Trinity Hall from 1982, and is co-founder of Fidelio Partners and a board member of Chapter Zero. So I hope you enjoy the discussion, and I'm going to hand over to Gillian. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Um, delighted to be here. I think we all are for this very topical um, discussion and very timely discussion. Um, when I first saw the title, two things sort of came to mind. One was, you know, profit versus planet. Are, are there certain things that only the government can do? And also by implication, is there an inherent tension between profit and the planet? Is, is, is business a force for good? Um, and certainly wearing my chapter zero hat, um, I you know, absolutely believe it is. Um, or or, or is, is business part of the problem? And this is undoubtedly themes that we're going to be um, discussing tonight. Um, before we turn to our excellent panel, I'd like to just turn to the audience and um, just to warm everybody up. Um, perhaps that wasn't the right sort of phrase in terms of global warming, but um, just, just, just to sort of, I was going to say break the ice either way. Um, we have a poll question. And if I could share the poll question, please. And our question is, if we are to have a hope of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels, who will need to lead? Will it be individuals? government or business? And so uh, let's see. Amy, if you can keep the poll running until we've got uh, a good range of answers. And if I could ask, I'm not sure that the panel can vote, but I think everybody else can. There we go. I think that's probably, Let's, uh, so we've got, interestingly, 54% are looking for business to take the lead. That's, that's very interesting, 38% government and 8% individuals. So if I could perhaps ask the panelists to take note of that and reflect, I'd, I'd be interested in your views and how you would have voted uh, when we come round to, um, uh, to, 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 to the discussion. Um, now, my opening, question for each of the panelists is um, their stance on this balance between government, business, other red lines, and, and certainly, I mean, if I, you know, take my perspective, um, I think COP says that, you know, if we look to COP, one of the stated aims is working together to deliver, and it, COP says we can only rise to the challenges of the climate crisis by working together. We must finalize the Paris rule book and accelerate action to tackle the climate crisis through collaboration between governments, businesses and civil society. And I think that would be you know, uh, my starting point. But I am going to ask each of our panelists to really set out their views on, on this um, balance between business, government um, and, and civil society. Um, but before we do so, um, Sir Adrian Montague wasn't able to join us tonight. He is at COP, um, but he's very kindly recorded a few words um, to share his views on, on this very subject. So if I could ask that we could um, move over to the, the recording, please. That's super. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this panel. I'm just sorry that my COP26 commitments 
prevent me from being with you in person. But I am pleased to try to set the scene with a few remarks on how business looks at climate change, which is obviously the most important issue of our days. First of all, let me just give you a brief personal introduction. I used to be chairman of Aviva, uh, the big insurance group, which is a leading investment a investor in renewable energy and green infrastructure. I now chair Manchester Airports Group, Cadent Gas, the largest gas distribution network in the UK, and Porterbrook Leasing, that supplies many of the trains that run on the UK's railways. They're all businesses that have a vital interest in climate change and are taking up the gauntlet of responding to challenges of net zero. For instance, Porterbrook has developed the first hydrogen powered train ready for mainline service, which is on display at COP26. Now, there's no doubt, I think, that the tectonic plates of business are shifting in response to the challenges of net zero. Not a day goes by without another big business announcing its response to climate change. Institutional investors are driving much of this action. As long-term investors, they want to see their companies adapt quickly for fear of stranded assets or businesses simply being left behind. So we're starting to see institutions deprioritizing or withdrawing from investments in high carbon emitting industries. And banks are beginning to review their lending policies to some of their traditional borrowers in industries like uh, the coal industry and perhaps the gas industry as well. The commitment of the G20 to uh, no longer support the financing of overseas coal plants, it's of course a, it's a welcome development, but it's quite a small step. And actually in areas such as this, perhaps we can say that financial services business are actually running a little ahead of the governments. However, there are very clear limits to what a business can achieve by itself. I think the key insight here is that climate change goals are a public good where only government can lead the way, but the concrete steps required to achieve these goals can only be realized with the active participation of the private sector. So perforce, there has to be a close collaboration between public and private sectors in translating the high level goals set by consecutive COPs into the detailed policy frameworks required to stimulate private investment. This is a fertile territory for controversy and policy differences. Consider, if you will, for example, the UK government's recently announced policy for domestic heating and the competing propositions of electricity and gas supplies. Are heat pumps the way forward or is hydrogen the least cost option? Resolving these issues alone has profound implications for national energy policy. What is the future electricity demand going to be? And how is it going to be met? By more renewables, by backup generation from gas plants, or even by a nuclear renaissance? And what's the right balance between domestic production and imported supply? The choices government makes here and more broadly as regards net zero are going to have profound implications as the consumer, both in the short term and in the long term. Little by little, we're all coming to realize that net zero involves an economic transformation at a level not seen since the Industrial Revolution. It will have a significant, but as yet unknown cost. Threats and opportunities, costs and benefits must be analyzed at every turn. But actually, it's the perennial question. What is the right balance between achieving net zero aspirations, security of supply, and affordability to the consumer? The debate has only just begun. So we're going to have a very interesting discussion in the course of the next hour or so. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to uh, our panelists. So um, a, a thank you to um, Adrian, who I, I um, I'm, I'm sure is is um, you know making those points at COP26 as 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 we speak. And I'd like to now turn to our other panelists and the breadth of experience we have with us tonight. 
to share their views on that opening question of that balance between government and um, business and, and individuals. And if I could start um, with David, and I'm delighted David's been tremendously supportive in uh, our work with Chapter Zero, and also brings a broad sectoral experience. And I think we can touch on perhaps, you know, a number of different perspectives here. So welcome, David, and um, your perspective. Well, thanks, Gillian. This is a, a, a big, big question. There's nothing I feel more passionately about uh, sitting here in 2021 uh, than the, the, the climate change. You know, I, I have three grandchildren, and I think when they grow up, they're going to say, look, Grandpa, you had quite a lot to do with making policies and big companies. And I was chairman of Sainsbury's for uh, 10 years until recently, and that is a huge company. We have a we, we, we have a huge impact across the country with the second largest retailer in the country. And therefore, we can influence hugely the, the, the supply chain that is out there. We hear a lot about supply chains right now. And I, I, I want to be able to say to them uh, when they're old enough, which is not that old, I guess, what, what did you do, Grandpa? That I actually say, well, this is what we did, and this is what we did, and this is what we did. And so that's one reason that I believe, in your terms of your question, Gillian, um, that uh, business, uh, you know, is not waiting for government. Business can do so much itself, has been doing so much for itself for a very long time. When I started at Sainsbury's in 2009, we, we, we really got onto this very, very quickly as a major part of uh, what we are saying to consumers. And indeed, consumers were demanding that we did things even then. And this is well over a decade ago. And sometimes it's disappointing to see that we haven't got further than we have, given the interest of consumers and others there. Even back in 2010, I remember the first investors saying, are you doing enough then uh, now? And as um, Adrian just said, they're a very important part of what's going on now because they're worried about what will happen uh, to this world and what they're in, in, involved in. And of course, it's also important if you're running a business, if you want to employ the best possible talent, people coming out of Trinity Hall, for example, uh, you know, in, in the next few years, that uh, you're showing that them that the sort of business they're going to be working with takes this very seriously. So look, um, at, at Sainsbury's, we did a huge amount and uh, many other companies have done a huge amount to, uh, to reduce our, our carbon footprint um, to, uh, and I can talk about all sorts of things we've done, but I don't want to go on uh, too much then. And I was pleased that my successors, uh, literally in the last few days, that they're, they're one of the sponsors of COP26 and they're in Glasgow now, brought forward Sainsbury's commitment to be net zero from 2040 to 2035. And that's a real thing, it's a huge amount to do yet, yeah, despite how much we've already done uh, to, to, to get that far. And getting into um, in, in particular, the supply chains of our suppliers and being effective there, effectively bringing the voice of the British consumer right down the chain to all those suppliers, whether they're the farmers in, in, in for the sake of argument, the West Country of England or the farmers in Kenya or whatever, that things are done in the right way, in a sustainable way. These things are really important. And even without government, we can exercise huge power. I'm not going to go on and say we can't exercise as much power as one would like without the government doing the right things, but I'm happy to come back to that later on because I don't want to talk for too long. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, David. And there's a number of points there, particularly yeah. the consumer. And I, I think that's something that we, we would sure. certainly like to come back to. So thank you very much. Can I turn to Ken? Um, and Ken, if you could perhaps share, you know, from a different perspective, a different industrial um, uh, background, um, your view on that balance between government and, 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 and business. And, and you may also wish to comment on, you know, the, 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 the um, implied criticism that's come out of COP um, over the past couple of days about the very strong representation from the fossil fuel um, sector, whether that's actually a good thing or whether that's, um, you know, part of the solution or part of the problem. But Ken, if I could ask you to make your opening statement, please. Thanks very much indeed. Hope you can hear me. I guess one of the things for me about this is um, going back to my education, going back as a chemical engineer and how we think about things. And we have a habit of looking at problems and challenges within the context of systems. And I guess the bit that I struggle with at the moment is so much of what we do today is trying to 
address issues within a very narrow and specific confine of an issue without understanding the broader implications and the bigger consequences. And I guess my concern is that because we don't look at that overall systems approach and how it impacts on the even bigger picture, that we are not fully exposed to the issues that we have to address, nor do we fully expose the consequences of the solutions that we're proposing. So I'd like just to think firstly about the issue of climate change. Look, we all agree that climate change is a critical problem, but it's a symptom of a much bigger issue. And that's that we're consuming far more of the Earth's resources than is sustainable. I remember as far back as the year 2000, we were predicting that world energy demand was going to double, if not treble, by mid 2050s. And why was that happening? It was happening because the population was growing. There were more, cons there would be more consumers out there. And that the other issue was that people were becoming more prosperous. They were buying their first fridge. They had electricity for the first time. They had air conditioning, they had a car. They were taking their first international trip on an airplane. So as populations grow and prosperity grows, that's why energy demand is increasing and why climate change is such a big issue. So the problems and issues we're facing with climate change are a subset of the bigger challenges, of the bigger challenge. But the issue for me is that the solutions we are looking at will only address part of the problem. And that's the easy and more palatable part. So what do I mean by that? I think if you're going to address climate change and the energy transition, we need to address both supply and demand. And at the moment, we are hoping that decarbonizing the energy supply, which is moving out of coal, moving out of oil, moving out of gas, and moving to renewables, will provide the answer. Now we foresaw back at the beginning of 2000, that even if renewable energy grew from the odd percentage point of world energy supply that it was back then, to 30 to 40% of the world's energy supply, then we would still have to double the amount of coal, oil and gas to meet that energy requirement. So we have to do more than just address the supply side. And then we will need to address demand. And it's becoming tricky because telling people they can't have the energy they want is not popular. And at the moment, we're avoiding that issue by hoping that technology will prove the answer. So by improving efficiency, by through breakthroughs in science and technology and engineering, that the efficiency with which we will use our energy to deliver a particular outcome will reduce the demand. When I think the reality is that we have to get our heads around the fact that we have to make do with less energy and that it will be more expensive. And that's going to translate into costs which will fall through to the consumer, either in terms of higher prices, higher taxes or reduced returns. And it will fall heaviest on the poorest in our society. And that's a bitter pill, an unpalatable pill to address. Now, within all of this, we talk about who should take the lead. I think governments provide the context within which this problem will be addressed. Because if you come back to it, it will be about a much bigger issue than simply climate change. And there are issues of societal frameworks that we have to get. Having said that, governments, given the nature uh, of them, have a time scale which is based on when's the next election, because it's by then that I need to be popular enough to get voted in again. The interesting thing about companies is that they have a much longer time scale. Why those scenarios that I'm talking about, about energy demand were surfacing? Why? Because as companies, we're going to make investment decisions that last for the lifetime of that asset. And that could be 20, 30, 40 years. And therefore, we need to get hold of that much bigger picture. So I'm agreeing. Governments set the framework. Businesses set the activity rate. And I think within that, we've also uh, got to remember 
that governments not only set the rules, but they've also got to set compliance standards as well. Because why else you might have very high standards if you've got low compliance or a low compliance culture, then there'll be plenty of cheats out there which will undermine the workings of those who want to work by the rules. And for most of the big companies, the government rules are a minimum standard. Most of the companies that I have worked with in the energy sector actually operate to much higher standards. And although we are condemned for only taking profit as our interest, I can never remember when my scorecard ever was just about cost or profit. There was always the bigger picture in there. And that might be a surprise to some, but it's a reality. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. That was um, very powerfully put, and I think an, a number of themes for us to, to think through. And yes, we tend to think that ESG has arrived in the last, you know, quite recently. It might have had a different name, but, but responsible business um, has been with us for, 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 for decades and, and indeed centuries. So uh, thank you. Um, I should just say, if anybody has questions on any of the points that are raised by our speakers, please do use um, the Q&A function. Um, and now I come to um, Andrew last, but absolutely not least, a different sector, um, um, a CEO, and I just welcome your views on that balance that we've been talking about between government and, and, and business and climate change. Thanks, Gillian. Um, you know, my role, you know, is... is a risk advisor and, and was the largest team uh, supporting the, the energy industry worldwide. I see the challenges faced in balancing profit versus protecting the planet with both our oil and gas clients and our insurers. Many of our clients are used to the high risk, high reward nature of their industry and often perceive renewables as a low margin alternative. Likewise, our insurers are also comfortable with a portfolio of oil and gas risks where losses can be catastrophic, but are infrequent. And view renewables as a class of business plagued with attritional claims that are hard to manage and therefore tough to make profitable. However, neither clients nor insurers have been left in any doubt as to the rapid changes that are necessary with the energy transition if we're to meet the decarbonisation goals set out at COP26 and stay within that one and a half degree target. Every conversation we have with our trading partners today recognises this. You know, the withdrawal uh, by the insurers of underwriting capacity, like the capital providers, for certain carbon intensive or environmentally sensitive activities is certainly the right thing to do. And if such action restricts the development of these projects, then the corollary of this is when they provide strong support for projects in the renewable sector, then insurers will be enhancing the bankability of these and con contributing more meaningfully to decarbonisation. But in my view, insurers need to go further and develop new products to support the new industries that bring new risks in the renewable sector. And that's where we see most resistance from insurers. They like to have years of historic data to support their underwriting models, and we do not have that luxury of time. I would argue that insurers took a bigger leap of faith with the development of the North Sea oil industry 50 years ago. But they did it then, and the UK has remained the dominant insurance market for upstream energy products to this day as a result, building the data and experience over time. We have the opportunity to do the same in renewables, and it does not need government intervention to enable the insurers to do this. Just the recognition of the opportunity and taking a long-term view. So there we don't need any government help. The insurers can do it. They just need to grasp the opportunity. As Adrian sets out in his commentary, where government involvement is required is in setting the policy to support the development of the renewable industries themselves. On the positive side, we've seen this recently with the announcement of the UK government hydrogen strategy, spurring both supply and demand. Once underway, then full economies of scale can be realised and the long-term future of these industries secured. 
On the flip side, we talk about a lost decade, a bit like uh, David's talk about the Sainsbury's initiatives, in carbon capture and storage, where 10 years ago, there was no technological barrier to the development and the depleted reservoirs were available, but there was no incentive to do anything about it. We even had the insurance solutions ready for it. And nothing has happened or very little has happened since in that development. So if we get it right now, then we can be a world leader in both the renewable industries and the insurance industries that develop with them. You know, to Ken's point, you know, what a business is doing about it with a long term view, I'd like to say that in our business, we are telling my whole team that all part of the energy transition and we're recruiting really heavily now with the skill sets to support the energy transition, bringing in more engineers uh, to position ourselves for what is a you know, long term, incredibly exciting opportunity for us to develop. And you know, I would have long retired before the real benefits manifest themselves 10 or 20 years out from today. But it's definitely got a role for government in setting policy, but there's so much businesses can do on their own without needing to wait for government to do anything. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and again, a number of themes, and, and, and I, I like the, the point that you raised about the change in sort of climate change competency and, and, and some of the skill sets that will be needed going forward, which is probably re very relevant for some of our panelists and, and some, well, particularly some of our um, audience um, today as well. Now we have a question, um, and the question is about um, really the just transition that we've all talked about. You know the role that business needs to play uh, in 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 um, mitigating climate change, but there's clearly going to be an impact and um, an impact on the poorest in society. And I think our question was specifically about um, the, the, the global impact on poorer countries who've, who've clearly been present at, at, at COP. And, and I ask our panelists their view on, you know, to what extent does business need to come up with solutions for climate change? To what extent does business need to take account of that just transition? And, and, and how, how to bring those two together? Um, so I open that question. I don't know. Um, David, would you like to start? With well, look, I mean, of course, it's an absolutely central question. Uh, the issues of equity um, around and the, there's the issue of equity between rich and poor just within the UK itself. So let me tell you that there's a huge chunk of people in the UK alone who would not welcome at all prices going up in the shops for the food they're buying uh, because we are spending a lot of money to tackle climate change. They just need to get to the end of the week without running out of money to feed their family. And that is written large around the world in developing countries. So it's a fundamental issue. And there's another fundamental issue of equity as well. Let's put it on the other point, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, those people may feel that, but how much are they thinking about the next generation and the next generation after that and the, after that? Because those consumers who we talked about are also voters. And the voters themselves very often are much more interested in, in, in their life and not uh, the, the unborn generations that, that come on. So the issues of inequity are fundamental in this and tackling those is not something business can do. It's not something a consumer can do and it's not something a one government alone can do, which is why, of course, the United Nations set up COP and everything else around it. But how you actually engineer compromise on this is what we're seeing playing out in front of us. And although quite a lot of compromises have apparently been put out there over the last um, 10 days, what are we told today? We're still on for 2.4 degrees of warming, which is a disaster for all of us, and in particular, our, our, our grandchildren. We, of our age, if you like, will probably get through uh, a, a lot of our life without suffering from this. So how we deal with this is a really tough question. And a lot of it, I'm afraid, is going to demand uh, the richer in society paying higher levels of tax and accepting a lower uh, standard of living uh, than they otherwise would for the good of the rest. And that is something for major politicians to think a, a lot about as, as we get to the back end of the next few days in, in COP. I'm not desperately optimistic, I'm afraid. 
uh, especially because the Chinese and Indians and the Russians ain't there. There is that big geopolitical question. I, I do agree. Uh, on um, the point about the just transition and inequity and any contribution that business can make, um, Ken or, or Andrew, any, any comments that you'd like to add? I think if we're talking about a just transition, a just transition, I think, demands something that, that we call an orderly transition. In other words, it's a thoughtful transition. And I guess one of the things that I always come back to um, is, 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 is the sorts of discussions that we had in my business when we were looking at the timeframes over which we're talking about to take. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we recognized that we couldn't basically forecast the future uh, because that's not possible. In my industry, if I could forecast the future, I would own ExxonMobil. I wouldn't be a shareholder in ExxonMobil. So basically, folk can't predict the future. But what you can do is look at scenarios about how the world might develop. The problem with that, over very many years, we developed pictures of the world to test our strategic um, imperatives and therefore our investment decisions. And they always cascade really into two worlds, two sorts of worlds. One in which common sense, science, technology, data, sound conclusions work through and the transition is made and it does have bumps in the road, but it's relatively orderly. And on the other side, the fact that we can't get our act together and it takes us to get a crisis. And it's only in the face of an absolute crisis in front of us where we make the right decision. The other dimension around that is the dimension of internationality. In other words, that we are an open and free world in which we recognize that there is a global problem and we all take ownership for it. And the other side of that coin is what we call barriers and barricades, where in the face of adversity, we put the shutters up around our countries and we take every, everything else out. And we look after ourselves, which of course we can't do when we're tackling with a global problem. And I think the issue is that when I look at it, I see a lot of evidence of this um, dislocation and waiting for crisis and this issue of barricades which is getting in the way of doing what we need to do and that orderly transition in which equity and the looking after of the least um, uh, the least of the most vulnerable people uh, in the world will fall foul of our own selfish interests and I guess that's the biggest challenge I think if we can get to a world where we will address the issues in a proper and considered manner together, as we do with the potential of COP, then I think we have a chance of an equitable transition. If we go back to what we're seeing in terms of others saying, actually, we're going to do our own thing and we're going to look after ourselves, just as we've seen in the pandemic and places like that, then that orderly transition is gonna be incredibly difficult to deliver. And we'll end up putting barriers around ourselves and seeking to do the best we can within the confines of what we can control. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for creating a sort of a path. There is a pathway forward there. And thank you for, for, for setting that out for us. Andrew, would, would you like to comment on the just transition and the role that business can play? Just. From my observation, and you know, we're, we're very much an international business, we, we look at developing parts of the world, and for them, it's all about affordability of, of, of energy. Um, and they will use coal-fired generation simply because it's the cheapest solution that they have to deliver power to, to the population. And you know, higher cost solutions really aren't viable for them. Um, and when we think about providing you know, affordable, reliable power, that contributes to better health and better education 
which is, you know, if you like, a, a fundamental human right. So, so trying to deny them that by restricting the development of, of coal-fired power generation is impossible. So I think the, the developed world has to contribute to building the, the renewable energy solutions in, in, the un, in, in the developing economies. I just don't think there's an alternative that, that's, that's viable. And whether that's done at a government level or at a business level, both, I think, is the answer. It has to come from both. Now, there's been quite a lot of talk, hasn't there, about the financial services industry financing no more coal mines, new coal mines. But the flip side of that must be as exactly as what you've just said, uh, Andrew, which is that, that they have to finance a lot of renewables instead. And the remarkable thing over the last decade has been how incredible the reduction in costs of renewables are, whether it's wind or solar. And you just think the massive amount of investment that we could be putting in with the riches of the world. Actually, and that's right. When we do it at scale, we drive the economies yeah. with it. And therefore, it does become cost competitive with the more obvious you know, coal fired generation solution. Look, absolutely. So that, this is where, going back to your initial question, Gillian, governments do have a big role, especially if governments can work together. Um, and um, so the, there is some incredible opportunities for governments to do things well if they will do it right. But there's plenty of other things that they're not doing right right now. But, you know, on Ken's demand side, though, you know, we still see governments around the world being you know, subsidising the cost of, of, you know, gasoline for cars, for instance, in certain countries, and then that's just spurring more demand because it's short termism and it's it's too unpopular to change the the, the government policy. Can I pick well, up on this just, point? Just, just to finish the point, Andrew, it's not just around the world. Look, in the UK, what happened in the budget two weeks ago? The <laughs> Chancellor reduced passenger duty air, on, on air, airfares within the UK. Reduced it, making the train even less attractive compared to the train before. And what did the government do for the 12th year running, I think? It actually froze fuel duty. So it's not just governments around the world. It's the UK itself puffing itself out as the great sort of... Uh, you know, host of COP who aren't doing the right thing all the time. And can why I, not? Because they're worried I, about their voters, who are the consumers. This is a really can important I, can point. I, can, I just can, can, can I just, <laughs> can, just one second, please? <laughs> um, I quite like to probe um, the voice, the uncomfortable messages. Now, you, I think government is often quite good at sort of sensing the pulse of the moment in the short term and responding um, to that. And you've also, all of you, talked about... Um, more complex decisions that need to be made. Um, I mean, I think you've talked about, you know, often we're talking about transition. So simply divesting of coal might not be the best, it might be the best answer for, I don't know, uh, sort of Rio Tinto or, or whatever, but it might not be the best answer for the planet. How, how does business communicate those complex? Because, and equally Greta Thunberg doesn't have much time to listen to that nuanced argument. And I'd be interested how business communicates in this very febrile in environment, which doesn't really have much space and time to listen to what sometimes need to be complex and nuanced messages. Ken, if I could start with you on, on that, please. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and I think that goes to the point that I was just about to make, which is as the pressure comes on for simple answers to complex problems, we see businesses responding, uh, sometimes not responding in a very good way, and countries responding. So for example, the other day I was at a conference and uh, this was an eminent international company and it told the audience how over the last year it reduced its environmental footprint by 30%. And when I dug further, I found that it had achieved that by selling its concrete business. And as a result of that world carbon uh, dioxide emissions had not reduced. They were no, it was simply, they were non, no longer within the sphere and remit of that company. Even worse than that, they, in, the, in these sorts of worlds, the companies that then buy those assets are less familiar with the issues and the responsibilities and accountabilities beyond the bottom line that go with them. And therefore we end up in a worse place. And the same goes for countries. How much of the 
climate change impact has the UK actually exported outside the UK? And I think one of the interesting things for that is that the responsible companies, and I'll, I'll come back to a topic that's in COP at the moment, which is about why were so many oil and gas companies and coal companies at COP26? Why? Because we see it as important. Because there's a real problem there that we're grasping, dilemmas that have to be resolved. But we're under such great pressure that we're under great pressure to cheat, to greenwash. Do you not understand that? Well, people don't because for an oil and gas company, whatever you do, you will be wrong. Attending COP is wrong. Well, if you hadn't attended COP, you would have been wrong as well. And I think the issue there is that as businesses and big multinational companies, we are struggling to do not the right thing because I think we can identify what the right things are about where investment needs to go, how we should shift our portfolio, how if we move assets away, we give them to responsible operators rather than irresponsible operators. But that complexity is not appreciated and we simply shouted at. And as I said, the danger of being shouted at is that you then respond to that shouting by doing the easy stuff, which is just getting it off your balance sheet. And that doesn't help anybody. Thank you. That's a very important point. I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Andrew, on, on um, this point about the complexity and communicating complexity to, to I guess, stakeholders and shareholders. Uh, no, I, we've experienced exactly the same as Ken says, you know, in the, in the oil industry, divesting of assets, uh, because perhaps investor pressure is encouraging that, but actually it achieves nothing on a net basis and can actually be counterproductive because a less responsible operator takes on those assets. Can I explore um, a sort of maybe a linked subject that, that some aspects of um, what business is doing attract <clears throat> a phenomenal amount of attention? I mean, I've worked in the car industry and everybody, you know, all the traditional um, car manufacturers um, are astounded when, you know, you have that trillion dollar uh, capitalization for Tesla. Um, and but the other dimension is we're also seeing space travel. And, you know, I've written on men go to Mars and women save the planet. Is it, are, are we in danger of encouraging sort of the glamorous and exciting and simple solutions um, and sometimes ignoring the hard work, which might be granular and much less um, newsworthy and I, I, and there's a diversity angle there as, as well. I'd, I'd like to ask my three male <laughs> panelists their view on do we actually need more diversity at that top table if we're going to address some of these issues? Ken. Yeah, I, I guess there was nobody more delighted than me when I saw William Shatner uh, go into space. I thought that was a <laughs> tremendous thing, but maybe that's a generational issue. I don't know. But there was a load of greenwash around that, how hydrogen had powered this and therefore there was only water emissions. And there was, of course, a great debate about how that hydrogen had been produced from renewable electricity, which was really, really great and absolutely fantastic. Missing, of course, the point that there's not enough renewable electricity in the world to satisfy all demands. So if you use renewable electricity to make hydrogen to then send somebody into space, actually somewhere on the line, somebody just burned a ton more coal somewhere. So I think this issue about you know, that greenwash and, and, and the implications around that are really uh, important. I think the other thing that I really worry about, and I really, really worry about it, is that the world is becoming more complex and more interrelated. And I only reflect that last month, if you remember, particularly uh, those living in the southeast of the UK, how we had panic buying of petrol and diesel, caused by no other issue than that somebody thought that you know, their local petrol station didn't have enough fuel. And the disruption that that cost, people couldn't get to work, businesses couldn't do their things, you know, ambulances couldn't get to their patients, all that sort of thing. Think about it in the world that we are facing now where everything will become electricity and everything will be clean. And all of a sudden we have panic buying of electricity. You'll have no lights, you'll have no heating, you'll have no communications you'll have no business, you'll have no transport, you'll have nothing. And in that world, 
one of the biggest issues we're going to be facing is one that we don't worry about at the moment, and that's the resilience of the system through which we're doing. And at the moment, governments don't own resilience, companies certainly don't own resilience, and there's a big issue there looking forward about how in this future world, which will have so much more interconnectivity, how do we handle these cross-sector and underpinning infrastructure issues in which one small hiccup can lead to a collapse of almost everything. Thank sure. you. We've got a question that's come in. Um, it's a slightly different angle here on nuclear energy, that, that actually one part of that resilience may be nuclear. Um, and we haven't talked about nuclear, obviously potentially controversial, but very much part of the government's um, strategy. Uh, if I could kick off with Ken and then turn to David and Andrew on, on nuclear. I, I'm, I think nuclear is going to be a big part of the answer if we're going to have a successful outcome. And uh, I say that really because um, one, it can deliver uh, power, electricity in huge quantities in a remarkably um, low environmental impact world. The issue that you have, and it, again, these are subjects that are very close to my heart, is around the major hazard consequence of nuclear, that if things go wrong and are not done well, then these things blow up and you have a nuclear explosion. I mean, you can do all sorts of damage. And the second thing is, is that the residual issues associated with nuclear are that you've got to clean it up after you've used it. And that will involve problems that, where you've got to have solutions uh, that will look after the issues over the next thousands of years. And that's just simply part of the reality. The key question is, is we have the ability to manage both of those issues, but there's a bit of a problem. And the problem again is one of public perception. Because nuclear power plants will have like Three Mile Island and Fukushima and things like that had nasty incidents in the past, people see them as toxic and therefore they don't want to go there. I thought you were going to share with us the fact that Germany has absolutely withdrawn from nuclear, which is, which is um, you know, uh, has been favorably commented upon in some ways, but has also caused huge challenges for Germany. I'd like Andrew's perspective on nuclear, more from a sort of perhaps an insurance perspective. I mean, I, I agree with Ken in that it has to form part of the mix. It's got to be part of the balance. There's, there's no, no one solution fits all. We need, you know, a high degree of base load for when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, as they say. Um, and a nuclear certainly provides that. The added comment I'd make though is we don't have the time to rely on nuclear. We can't install enough in the time frame that we need to, to try and hit any of our climate goals. I mean, the, the, the one and a half target, which is already looking improbable, is impossible. Thank you. Um we are gradually coming to the end of this hour, and it's a huge subject. And I'd like to um, turn to David. We've got quite an interesting question, which is sort of turning things on, 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 on their heads and saying, what actions can individuals take to make a difference with business and with government? Um, and not just sort of individual actions, but, 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 but to really influence you know, a company like Sainsbury's, for, for example. So, David, you, you talked about consumers quite a lot, and perhaps we could, I could start with yeah, you. Sure. Well, I think it's a very good question, and there's lots of small things we can all do. The BBC ran a series on this, um, was it last month, the month before? There's lots of small things we can do. Uh, but time and again, you come back to, you know, uh, government and business on this. So, for example, um, uh, replace your um, uh, gas-fired um, boiler with a heat pump. Uh, Marvellous, but it'll be costing you quite a lot of money. Would you like to do that? Um, well, I think some, some people do. Some of us have done these sorts of things, even though we know it's not economic. But what it demands of government is real investment and subsidies to get these industries going, just as eventually that happened with wind power and solar power. So there's individual things that individuals can, can do. But above all, and forgive me for turning into this because I haven't had a real opportunity of getting back to this, government have to set the right economic policies and the right tax framework to nudge people into the right direction. 
because I'm afraid there's only so many of us who will do the right thing, even if it's going to cost us economically, partly because, of course, we've got the resources to do so. So I'm really disappointed in COP. Maybe I haven't been listening close enough. There's been so little talk about carbon taxes, and I can talk quite a lot about carbon taxes. I believe in them and cap and trade schemes and so on. I haven't got enough time to explain those, but I'm happy to, to do that because it nudges people, individuals and businesses in, in the right direction. And also, you, you know, you can erect barriers by having carbon, board tax, carbon border tax adjustments so that other countries which don't have carbon taxes can be put in the same way with tariffs and so on. Now, I'm an old economist from Cambridge, I, I know, and I'm very interested in this, but that is the way you get consumers to do the best possible thing. And what I'm desperately unhappy, you slightly referred to it when you just talked about Greta Thunberg as well, is one of the reasons we haven't got these things. It's not just that people feel that uh, voters don't like the idea of new taxes. You can get down that easily by saying, yes, you're going to put these taxes up, you're going to take other taxes down, VAT or whatever it is. Uh, so there's no reason for the overall burden to go up on the population. But one of the reasons is because the green movement somehow is so lacking in belief in capitalism that they think you can't have taxes and taxes don't make sense and so on. Honestly, use the economic system. Economists understand it. So do plenty of people in government. We're not using that to gently nudge people in the right direction, gently nudge businesses in the right direction. It will have a huge impact and does where it's actually um, taking place. Thank you. Um, Andrew, Ken, do you want to add anything on the the, 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 the nudge. I mean, we have actually got a question along those lines, which is how, if you were government, would you would you nudge whether it's um, uh, in, in terms of energy consumption or, or meat consumption or or, um, or ho foreign holidays? A a any comments, uh, Andrew? Perhaps. Yeah, I've touched on the, the, the whole sort of carbon cost issue around carbon capture and storage uh, earlier, and, and in the absence of that, you know it's not going to happen at any, at any scale that we need. Um, and I think that sort of incentive at an individual level is required from government as well. I mean, I, I was reading an article in The Economist was talking about, you know, a personal carbon allowance. And then if you want to use more of it, then you have to go and buy it. And that, that might seem far-fetched. It was actually proposed a decade ago. And today, you know, with mobile technology moving on where it has, it's looking more feasible than it did a decade ago. But it's that sort of approach that's going to be required to change people's behaviours, I think. Here, here, because that's what they're doing in business with this, the schemes that we have in, in, in Europe and indeed in the UK for part of our industry. And you could imagine a time when board directors have to disclose their carbon footprint at, at, at an AGM. Maybe it's not, not as far-fetched. Um, sorry, Ken, I interrupted you. I think you had a point to make there on, on, on that, uh, that nudge, what governments can do to nudge. Oh, well, I, I agree with, um, with what the other two presenters have, have said. I, I, I think those nudges are there. The thing is, they have to be sustainable. And I think the issue that I see is particularly with one of the biggest nudges that we have at the moment, which is based around the fact that electric vehicles uh, basically have got no taxation, is that there are going to be some very, very painful issues as we have more electric vehicles on the road. As, um, as the operator of uh, a major oil company's UK business, uh, every month I used to sign a cheque for £365 million pounds to the UK exchequer. And that's because I was providing about a sixth of the UK's uh, oil products uh, to the transportation system. So there were six other folk doing that. So do the multiplication, look at the number of billions. And at some point, when we get rid of petrol and diesel, somebody is going to have to pay that amount of money into the exchequer via some other means. And, you know, part of the issue that I understand uh, out there is now, the, there will be means by which electricity that goes into vehicles will be able to be distinguished from electricity that's used for everything else. And you can imagine taxation systems uh, running in around that. So electric vehicles will no longer be cheap in future. They'll become as expensive, if not more so, as running petrol and diesel cars. But, but it will be artificial, of course, Ken. It will be tax-based. Yes. It won't be because the underlying, uh, you know, efficiency is not uh, much better than uh, 
uh, the internal combustion engine uh, in terms of looking after the planet. Thank you. We are coming to the to the top of the hour, and I, I would really like to ask each of the panellists just one final question. We've got a few days left from COP. If there's one thing that you would like to see coming out of COP26 uh, in Glasgow, what would that be? Um, and if I can start um, again, perhaps with David, if I could start with you. What is oh, the I, it come, it'll come back simply, Gillian, to what I just said. If it was possible for every developed country in the world and as many undeveloped as possible as well, simply to agree on a carbon tax, it doesn't even have to be that high. Ten pounds of ten, ten dollars, twenty dollars a ton. Suddenly, people would have the right economic signals throughout the world to do the right thing. And it, I despair that that is not coming out of it. Some of the simplest things like that. Just add that to the brilliant technologies that are coming along, dealing with so many of these problems, whether it's hydrogen or whether it's electrification of various things and other things. Indeed, carbon capture and storage. There's so many brilliant ways of dealing with this issue. But add to that the simple use of economics. Like, well, you know, I go back to some of what I learned at Trinity Hall all those years ago, how effective these things can be. The behavioral like, impact as well. Behavioral ball nudging and all of that, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Ken? I guess, I guess I struggle because uh, as, as, as an engineer and a businessman, I have to operate have to believe, have to look at the world in which we exist rather than the world in which I'd like it to be. And I guess, as we've just heard, if we could have some consistency, albeit how small, with regard to setting a, a global framework within which we can actually address these issues, that would be brilliant. My worry is that we can't because the fragmentation that will go because some of the things we need to do will be so unpalatable that it won't happen. If that is the case, then if that doesn't work, let's tell the truth. Let's tell the whole truth. And I explain, your attention, please. And I explain your attention, just how big a crisis please. this is. And it goes beyond climate change. And it's bigger than that. Let's create that crisis so that we will then confront the important things that we need to do. Gosh, that's a powerful answer. I wasn't quite expecting that answer, but if we can't get the, the answer we want, then, then yes, the, the truth. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Andrew might have had an alarm or something in the back. That's all right. It was only a test. It must be seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Andrew, um, it is seven o'clock. What, what, what is the one thing that you would like to see coming out of COP? Ah, uh, well, I think a ban on space tourism until 2050. Put all those rocket scientists to work on the renewable energy sector. I mean, you touched earlier, I mean, we need glamorous projects. Well, actually, a lot of the projects in the renewable energy sector are incredibly exciting. And that's where all our energies should be put at the moment. That's Excellent. my view. Hit those targets by 2050 and then we can bring the tourism back in. Well said, well said. Well, I'd like to thank um, our panelists spot on. We're at seven o'clock. So um, really lots of food for thought there. Um, I think we've probably asked as many questions as we've sought to answer, um, but some quite powerful answers at the end as well as to what needs to come out of COP. So thank you all very much. And on that note, I'd like to just hand back to Rochelle. Thank you so much, Gillian, and thank you to our panel. Very lively uh, and interesting discussion. Uh, it's the last in our climate change series of events tomorrow. We've got a webinar by our fellow Professor Adam Branch on his research on climate justice. So he'll be looking at climate change and non-fossil fuels in East Africa. But all the recordings for all of our climate change uh, series of events will be on the Trinity Hall YouTube channel and details of all of our future events, both in person and online, can be found on our website. And I'd just like the opportunity to thank all of you that made donations alongside booking for our online events. These donations make a huge difference in supporting our students. So thank you so much. So a final thank you to our alumni on the panel, to Gillian, to Andrew, to Ken, to David and Adrian for sending in a recording. Um, thank you to everyone at home for watching and hope to see you back in college again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Gillian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.